make sure to pick up your, your card. Uh, hope everyone had a nice weekend. Welcome to a brand new week. Uh, what questions do you have about the lab, stacks and queues, Java, anything we've been, we've been looking at? When I was coding the third, yes, this is the very last public thing, um, there is this sort of if statement below the wall that sort of says that current, that front is not easy to tell. Well, when you like edit the code, as you could tell, it works. I wasn't really sure why it works. And was, yeah, yeah, that's that. So current that part is never equal to tell. So what's really the use of having that if statement there? Um, let me see if I can find what you're looking at. It's so frustrating. You're talking about this public movement at the very end. Um, yeah, I just need to pull it up here. Okay, so one uh, nifty thing about Visual Studio Code, which I actually just learned about recently, and is useful if you're in a file with a, a bunch of methods like this double link list. So up here at the top, there's this sort of chain of things here, and it tells me which folder I'm in, which file I have open, which class I'm in. And if I click on the method, I get a whole list of all the methods, and I can jump to any particular one of them. So we're talking about the removing of a value, correct? Uh, and so you were saying this tail equals current up prev. Uh, no, the very first, the second, actually, uh, if statement. Uh, here? No, the one that is above it. Um, yeah, so uh, first step of removing something with a value, we go through the list to see if we can find where it is. If we found something, we want to remove that, uh, that node. And with, this is before we have our dummy nodes. There are three different cases we have to consider. There's the node that we want to remove is at the head. And so the pre, it won't have a previous thing. And so this is checking, does it have a previous node? Because if it doesn't, then it's the head. And so to remove it, we change the head to be the next node. Okay. Um, similarly, this is checking, is it the tail? Because if it's next is null, it must be at the end of the list. Um, and adding our dummy nodes makes this kind of considerably nicer in terms of we actually are checking, does something equal head or equal tail, uh, which is just a little clearer what's going on rather than these comparisons to null. So... If we're adding the dummy nodes, we can remove those if statements that are checking if we're at the head? So, not quite. Uh, so, we still have um, the, we have the same three cases. Um, as we have our dummy head So nodes in between them and a dummy tail. And we have a loop that maybe starts right after the head goes through until it gets to the tail for looking for um, uh, the, the value that we need to remove. And so if we've made it through the loop, and if one of two things has happened. We've either found an, a node with the value we're looking for, or we looked all the way through and got to the tail. And so we're going to need some kind of if statement to check. Did we get all the way to the tail, or did we stop somewhere before the tail because we found a node that has the value? 
Because if we got all the way to the tail, then we don't want to remove anything. We didn't find uh, a node with, with that value. If we didn't get to the tail, then then we uh, uh, <clears throat> then then we do want to remove that node, uh, and <clears throat> we can do something like current does not equal tail. And I know that I have said when we're dealing with objects, we always need to use dot equals, and that's almost always true. Because this statement says, is current literally exactly the same object as tail? And in this case, that's actually what we're trying to check. Is the current node we got to literally the exact node that is the tail, rather than a node that's merely equivalent to the tail, but different? Yeah, Paul. So if we were to use the dot equals, would that be doing the same thing? Or is it slightly different? Uh, so all objects in Java have an equals method. I think by default, because we didn't implement uh, an equals method for the list node, it will have the default one. And I think the default one will do the same thing as this. Uh, but I'd need to double check to be sure. But I think that's what it does. Does this answer your question, Amity? Partially. <laughs> the way I'm looking at it, well, I can't ask the question without saying what I did. Can I see what I did? Uh, that, that would be best for office hours. Other questions? Rebecca. This is about lab three. Is this a partner assignment with our partner assignment? Uh, great question. Lab three out today. You're going to be using a stack to implement uh, to actually implement a little programming language. You're going to write a Java program that implements another programming, stack-based programming language. Uh, this is a partner lab, so unless you tell me otherwise, I will assume you are working with the same partner as lab one, or with not a partner. Charlie? So if we're like, if we pass, pass like the majority of the tests and there's like one or two that's like really driving us crazy, could you like, just turn that in and take, like, would we just get, like, points off, like, relative to how many tests we passed? Or, like, would we, like, lose all the points because we didn't pass them all? Uh, in terms of the lab two grade and the tests, uh, the points that you will lose for failing tests will be proportional to the number of tests that are failing. Um, so it's not the case that, like, two failing tests, you get zero out of those 15 test points or, or what's on the rubric. Other questions? Brian. Um, for the dot equals method, will it still work if the uh, link list is made up of um, primitives? Uh, that's a good point. The only time that we can't use dot equals is when we're dealing with primitives. Because all objects have a dot equals, primitives do not. Uh, so here, these are two list nodes. I know they're objects. Uh, so I could definitely use dot equals uh, with those. Uh, if instead of this kind of placeholder object E for the values, if all the values were lowercase i ints, then you couldn't use dot equals. That would be a compiler error. Uh, you'd have to use the, the equals equals or exclamation point equals. But uh, this is why when we're uh, implementing data structures, we are typically going to have them uh, only contain objects rather than they can contain objects or primitives because you can't always use the same code with both of those. And then uh, it's, it's kind of limiting where they're like we have all these object versions of primitives. Like we've seen that uh, we might have an array list of capital I integer. And if we were to add a primitive into this, it would turn it into this object version automatically. 
Other questions? All right. Let's review what we have learned about uh, stacks. So here is a, uh, a section of, of Java code. Uh, is this readable by the, the folks in the back? Too small? Uh, all right, I will make it bigger. Uh, give you a chance to, to read through it. And then when we, uh, I will write out on the board the different choices. A is ABCD choices in terms of what will be printed when this code is, is run. Uh, the array deck is Java's standard uh, double-ended queue is what they recommend you use if you want stack the kind of uh, stack like behavior with the push and pop methods. All right, some votes for all four possibilities. Please discuss with your neighbors. Uh, maybe draw out uh, a, a picture of the stack and what's going to, to be happening to it. A lot of movement toward D, that's great. That's exactly what this, this code will do uh, when, it, when it runs. Uh, what is, can someone just uh, just so we're all on the same page, remind us what uh, the kind of basic uh, function of a stack is when we put things into it, take things out. Yeah, we have... uh, last in, first out. Exactly. Last in, first out is like a, a literal stack of books or trays or whatever. We're putting, pushing stuff onto the top of it and then popping off the top. Any questions about this code or why we'll print out this stuff? Brian. Um, am I just thinking or remembering wrong, or is like, is this just called array deck, or because I thought decks were supposed to be queues. Uh, yeah. So Java actually has a stack class in its standard library. It's was uh, it was implemented in the very early days of Java, and it works pretty differently from the rest of like array list and link list and all of this. Uh, and so uh, the Java documentation recommends that if you want stack operations like push and pop, you should use this array deck, which uh, does stand for, uh, deck stands for double-ended queue, uh, but it really is, and there's uh, in the uh, notes from Friday, there's some example code of how you would do this, uh, but you can use an array uh, to do kind of efficient operations at the beginning and end, uh, like a double-ended queue. Uh, you still have to, to do kind of double the size and copy things over when uh, the number of elements gets too big. Uh, but the array deck is, is what you would tend to use if you want uh, stack-like behavior in Java. Liam? If you were to use add instead of push, would that be a queue instead? Uh, so a good question. If we, what if we used uh, add instead of push? Uh, we can look up Java array deck. And look at add. And it says inserts the specified element at the end of this deck. And if we look up push, 
pushes element onto the stack represented by this deck. So the documentation actually doesn't tell us if we're using stack operations, whether it's the beginning or end. Uh, and I think this is deliberate because you shouldn't be mixing queue operations and stack operations on the same data structure. You should either be treating it as a queue or treating it as a stack. Uh, and often, if the documentation does not have to tell you some detail about how it's implemented, such as are you pushing at the beginning or end, it won't. Because then they're free to change it without having to break maybe some assumption someone has made based on the documentation. So I would guess that it pushes it at the end. You could uh, write some test code using the array deck to verify whether it's pushing at the beginning or end. Uh, and so if it pushes at the end, then switching push to add would, would not change anything. Uh, would just make the code uh, a little messy mixing pop and, and add together. Other questions? One bit of terminology to review from last time. Uh, what does it mean for something to be an abstract data type? All right, again, some votes for all four options. Please discuss with your neighbors uh, why you chose the one you did. Uh, and a reminder, when I introduced stacks and queues last time, I introduced them as abstract data types before uh, getting into other things. Uh, big movement toward B. That's excellent. This is what uh, what an abstract data type will, will do. Seraphine? I actually have a question. Because it's like, I know in class, the one, the one thing that, that that was said is like, abstract data types, like, they separate logical behavior from implementation. But it's like, what is logical behavior? Yes, yeah, so I deliberately used different words in this answer than uh, the specific words I used last time uh, to get at kind of the, the core idea uh, that I said last time an abstract data type is going to tell us the logical behavior of a structure that is uh, uh, separate from details of the implementation. And then I went on to describe the logical behavior of a stack as something that you could push values onto and pop values off of, and you got last in, first out. And uh, a queue is something you could add values to and remove them, and it had first in, first out behavior. And so logical behavior and the external operations of a structure are uh, very similar ideas where if I tell you a, a stack has an external operation of push and pop and push has this effect of pushing something onto the top of the stack and pop has the effect of removing and returning whatever was most recently pushed of describing what these external operations are has the same effect as telling you, okay, what is the logical behavior of this structure? Because by explaining these external operations, I'm telling you here are the things you can do with a stack and here's the effect they have which is uh, exactly what I did when I, when I described logically how does a stack function. So external operations have, is maybe a, a bit more like I'm going to write down the name of the Java methods versus logical behavior it was kind of entirely abstract. Uh, but they're both saying how can you actually use this data structure as opposed to not any details of how these operations are implemented. Does that make sense? Other questions on this? All right. So main uh, topic for today 
is motivated by the following uh, issue. On the last uh, quiz, I uh, uh, asked you to uh, uh, implement a, a method that counted how many times a string showed up in a linked list. And uh, many of you Many of you uh, made good use of the linked lists public get method uh, to write something like uh, we'll start the count at zero, and then we'll have a for loop over the indexes. of the list, and inside the list we'll say if list.get of i, if the element at index i equals s, add one to our count of how many times this string has shown up in the list, and then after the loop return our count. Does this code make sense to everyone? Any questions about this? So we have a problem, however. Uh, one is that this method relies on this uh, a data structure that we're counting things in to have a get method. Uh, and it would be nice if we had some way to write a version of this that didn't depend on that, that, had, that uh, used maybe a more general uh, uh, interface for getting it. But the, the real issue that I wanted to talk about is this, the fact that on a linked list, uh, this is not going to be a very efficient uh, uh, way of doing this. So let's think about the efficiency of our get method as we go through uh, this loop. So let's assume that this get method starts at the beginning of the list and loops through the nodes until it gets to the, the node at a particular index. That's, uh, 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 I expect, what you are, are implementing in, in, the, uh, in the lab too. And so when i is, is 0, uh, how many nodes uh, does our get method kind of visit? How many nodes does it go through? Yeah, Aiden's holding up uh, one. And it's visited, one. How about when i equals one? How many nodes? Yep, we visit two nodes. When i equals two. Yep, we again start at the beginning and go through uh, three nodes to get to index two all the way up until we have i equals size minus one. It's kind of our last time around the loop. Uh, and let's say this capital N, that's how many total nodes, total number of things in our list. Uh, this last time we're around the loop where we're getting the last thing in the list how many nodes do we do we visit there? 
Exactly. We have to go all the way through all n nodes in our list uh, in order to find the last one. So if we just total all of these up, uh, summing 1 through n, this is going to give us uh, n plus 1 times n over 2. And the intuition for this being that n plus 1 gives us n plus 1, n minus 1 and 2 would give us n plus 1, n minus 2 and 3 would give us n plus 1, and we basically can make n over 2 of these pairs of these terms that sum up to n plus 1. So it's going to give us n squared plus n over 2 is kind of the number of steps, the number of nodes we have to go through in these loops. Uh, and when our kind of number of steps has this n squared term, we've talked about efficiency being constant or linear. Here we see an example of efficiency that would be quadratic, that if we have uh, twice as many elements in our list, it's going to take four times as much work to do this count method. Another way of uh, seeing that is we have this loop over all the elements. That's a linear operation. And within each linear operation, we call get, which is itself a linear operation. So kind of linear within linear, linear times linear gives us quadratic. Does that make sense how I, how I got to this? Why this count method would have this efficiency? All right, well, this is, this is no good. Quadratic is, is slow. If n gets really big, uh, like when n is 10 to 100, like linear versus quadratic, uh, it's going to be, be hard to notice, uh, but if n is a million or a billion, this n versus n squared starts to really matter. And also logically, if we, if we had the list out in front of us, we ought to be able to just look at each node once and keep account of how many times we've seen a particular element. Uh, that, sure, when we use get to do this, we have to keep kind of re-looping uh, through the list, but like if we could just go through each node uh, once, that would still allow us to, to count this up. But going through each node once would require access to internal data of our linked list. Like the, 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 the head node uh, and its next uh, field and, and so on. This is all private, locked away inside our linked list. And there's a good reason for that. We don't want someone to just be able to start messing with the next and previous uh, inside the list because then our list operations might start to become invalid. We kind of want this information encapsulated nicely inside our linked list, linked list class. And so... Java's solution to this is say we, we would really like some efficient way to uh, 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 traverse the elements of some structure is the iterator interface. And remember an interface, uh, uh, who, can, who can remind us what, what an interface means or what an interface is? Sarah, who? I find it's just methods that you can access, but you have to code yourself. Yeah, it's, it's saying like something that implements this iterator interface 
we'll also we'll implement whatever methods are, are part of that interface. The interface doesn't implement them. It's just sort of a promise that some class that is an iterator that implements this interface will have the following two methods. Has next and next, where this has next, true or false, is there another element left to iterate over? And the next method says, uh, return the next element that we're iterating over. And so an iterator is going to be like we're keeping a, a finger, we're remembering our spot in a particular sequence, uh, in, a, in a particular data structure, like remembering a particular node in the linked list. And then that iterator can say, is there a next node to go to? And it can also move to the next node and return the value there. Does this make sense? Any questions? Rowan? I'm still a little confused as to how like, using an interface differs from just defining this function. So what we, why this interface is useful is it's going to let us do something like uh, 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 we're going to have uh, um, like our our uh, We'll have an interface called iterable, which says you are going to have a method that returns an iterator And with these two together, we can say that our linked list implements iterable. Our array list implements iterable. Our array deck. implements, iterable, and so on, which means that these three different data structures, separate implementations, we say all of them implement this iterable interface. So all of them have a method called iterator that returns an object that has these two has next and next methods. So we're providing a kind of single uniform way to iterate, to go through the elements of all these data structures by having these kind of shared interfaces. So that's the main value of an interface, is that we can kind of say anything that implements iterable will have this method. And then whatever returns will be an iterator, which again, regardless of its implementation, will have these two methods. And that means we can have this shared uh, set of operations among a bunch of different classes, which is one of the main values of, of an interface. Other questions on this? All right, 
let's take a look at what this would actually look like uh, if we were to code it up. So I might say, I want a class. It's a singly linked list uh, iterator where I'm just going to use a singly linked list here to kind of keep things uh, simple. And uh, remember, this is a class that kind of wants to keep track of where it is uh, in, uh, in the linked list. So I might have some private uh, list node called current. And then uh, I have my, I, I say that this implements an iterator of E. I would need to import java.util.iterator uh, to do that. And I know it has the has next method, which I might say, uh, if I have a current node, uh, how do I tell when that node is now the end of the list? Yeah, it's it's when it when it is null, right? When when the node that I'm on eventually ends up being null. Again, this is without our our fancy dummy nodes. Uh, when it's null, I've reached the end of the list. So I could say if current does not equal null, then haven't reached the end of the list yet. And so there's still a next element in my linked list that I could could provide. And when I want to provide the next element, I can say get the value in the current node, move current to the next node in the list, and then return the value. Yeah, Peter. I'm a little confused. Why would you just be saying Current's not null because current could could be not null, but the next one could be, or like, the, the, but there could there could not be a next one. Yeah. So here I am treating current as as suggested by this. Now the current is the next, like the node with the value that will be returned in the next call to next. Okay. So. As long as current isn't null, it's referring to a node I haven't returned the value from yet. Okay. And then once it becomes null, there are no more values in the list to return. Other questions on uh, this code so far? All right. We have... The need, however, for a constructor. And so I would like you to discuss with your neighbors uh, what it is uh, that we might want to do in this constructor to kind of set up this iterator to start at the beginning of our list. So take a couple of minutes and, and think about, okay, where would we start this variable current in order to have this iterator go through our list. Alright, I've, I've heard I've heard some of you kind of running into our, our conundrum that we have here. So uh, what's what's something that, that someone is considering is what we would want to do if if we could in, in this constructor. Okay. Yeah, exactly. We, we really like to say start at the head node of our list. Why can't we do this? 
There. It's a widening fee? Exactly. We, the head is a private field of a linked list. So even if we said, okay, we're going to take in a linked list here that we can construct the iterator from, we can't do list.head because head is a private field. And so the way that we want to write this iterator depends on private internal data of the linked list class. And for that reason, we're not going to implement this iterator outside of the linked list class, but we're going to implement it inside of the linked list class. So we're going to say inside our singly linked list class, we are going to have a private singly linked list iterator class because when it's inside of our singly linked list class and, and we have our private list node head, we can just access that field directly. So this is, an, uh, as we saw with uh, the, the list node class in, uh, the, uh, in the lab and other places, that was a private class inside the linked list class because the list node is something that kind of shouldn't exist on its own outside of a linked list. It's only an internal part of the list. Similarly, this iterator is kind of an internal uh, uh, part of our uh, linked list class that can access its private data. And then our singly linked list implements our iterable interface. and thus has a iterator method that is just going to return a new singly linked list iterator. So we define a internal class one of these private inner classes that whenever we create it, it starts at the head and it just keeps track of where it is and it goes through the list. And then we have a public method that someone using our linked list can, act, can ask, give me an iterator for this list. And we return this object that only exposes this has next and next method. And can we can use that iterator to go through uh, go through the linked list without needing direct access to the internal head or, or list node or, or the next fields. So just to bring this full circle, this lets me rewrite my count by saying using the iterator method of the linked list to get this iterator that kind of keeps track of, of where it is, and then saying while While this iterator has elements left to iterate over, if iter.next equals the string we're looking for, counter plus plus. So I've just changed that for loop over all the indexes the one that I get the iterator, and then I just go through the things in the iterator uh, for however many there are. 
and knowing what we so knowing what we know about our iterator class, we, we have the implementation of it. Uh, take uh, take a moment and discuss with your neighbors what the efficiency. We talked about how the old count was quadratic. Discuss with your neighbors what the efficiency of this new count that uses the iterator uh, would be. Would it be uh, uh, improved, the same, or, or worse than the one that used the get method? All right. I think it will be linear. <clears throat> Why is that? Um, given the while loop that is really depending on the size of the iterator object, which depends on the list. So the longer the list, the more time it's going to take. And that's linear. Yeah. Yeah, that we kind of intuitively expect this loop to go through our list, and a loop that goes through each thing in a list, we uh, have the intuition is that that would be linear. Uh, if we look at has next, would has next be constant, linear, something else? Here. Exactly. Our has next going to do just running this method. We'll do like one step. Check current, regardless of which node current is current is, is at. So calling has next once. That's going to be constant. How about calling next once? Yeah. Also, also constant doesn't. Uh, just going to be these three steps. And so we know that this loop is going to call next for each node in the list and call has next for each node in the list. And these are both constant, so that's sort of a constant amount of work for each node in the list, which indeed works out to linear. We're doing amount of work that's proportional to the number of nodes in our list. And so this is the, the big advantage of having this iterator is before when we were using git, writing this count, we could, we could only do as, as good as quadratic. Here we have made a big improvement and can, using this iterator, even without access to kind of the internals of the list, loop through the list uh, each node exactly once. Does that make sense? What are your what are your questions on this? The iter oh yeah, sorry. I'm gonna show that if there's a multiple question, but do you think after class you could just share what with us the files we we pulled it up? Uh, yes, the the all the code that I wrote is in the in the notes for today. Uh, yeah, so uh, anytime I I write code that is not in the notes, I I will share that file. Um, one neat thing that having an iterator uh, lets us do is uh, use Java's for each loop. So we could even write this as use this for each loop syntax where the thing that we are that comes to the on the right of the colon has to be an iterable, has to implement the iterable interface in order to be used in this spot. Because if it implements the iterable interface, then it has an iterator that this for loop will use to go through each element of the list. And so like the, the Python for loop where it would be for x in list, where you would go where x would be assigned to each element of the list, this will do the same thing using an iterator. 
and then we can just use that variable x inside the loop. And so this wouldn't be any more efficient than that version that I wrote using the while loop and next. It's just a little nicer code-wise. All right. Questions on anything about iterators or any of the, the Java that we've looked at so far today? All right. I think that means it's time to talk about Abraham Lincoln, 16th president of the United States, uh, far from a uh, particularly obscure figure in history, like uh, most of the presidents we've talked about so far. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, perhaps the most uh, iconic figure in American history, as much as a, a, a symbol as historical figure uh, at this point. Uh, notable, of course, uh, because he was president uh, during the U.S. Civil War, a war in which I believe more Americans died than all the other wars uh, the U.S. has been in put together. Uh, and this map uh, here shows uh, how the U.S. Uh, broke apart with the states in blue being the ones that banned slavery the states in red being the ones that uh, seceded and left the U.S., uh, the dark red ones first. The yellow states being those that allowed slavery but remained as part of the United States during the war. Uh, not shown here is that this is when West Virginia comes into existence. When Virginia left the U.S., folks in West Virginia decided that they didn't want to, and so they left Virginia instead of leaving the U.S., uh, an interesting thing about a figure as discussed as Lincoln is the variety of ways in which historians and other people have, have written and talked about Lincoln as a lifelong moral crusader who uh, hated slavery his whole life, uh, as just sort of a, a guy pushed and pulled by events without any uh, clear vision. Uh, as an ambitious politician, you can look at and see like, oh, he's, he said kind of one thing in this speech to one audience and an entirely different thing to another audience. So he was just trying to say, you know, whatever was going to get him to political power. Uh, people have, have written about Lincoln as a racist, supporting uh, uh, removing slaves from the United States to another country. Uh, and also as Lincoln as someone who changed over time, who, whose views... Uh, changed throughout his life, changed during the Civil War. Uh, and so on the on uh, the U.S. money and uh, definitely the, the most well-known of, of the presidents, I'll talk about this term. All right. In uh, the notes for today, there are... Uh, other examples of uh, things that we can do with iterators. So far we've seen iterators as uh, traversing the elements of a list. Our singly linked list, list iterator kind of traverses, goes through the elements of a list. Uh, we can also use iterators to generate elements of a sequence. So uh, some of you may be familiar with the uh, Fibonacci sequence. Uh, we start with 1 and 1, and how do we get the, the next term in the sequence? Anyone know? Yeah, yeah exactly. We add the previous 2, so 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, and so on. Uh, and we can actually implement an iterator that every time we call next returns to us the next element of the Fibonacci sequence. So it's not an iterator that is traversing some data structure, but one that is kind of generating uh, elements of a, of a sequence. 
And just like we saw with our traversing iterator, because an iterator is an object, it can maintain data about kind of where in the sequence it is. Like for Fibonacci, it can keep track of what the previous two were. And so it, can only, it will require only a constant amount of work to get the next element of the sequence, rather than having to, if we want, say, the 10th, we don't have to sort of start at the beginning and do a bunch of additions to get the 10th. We can immediately say, oh, we have the 8th and 9th, so we just know the 10th. can also use iterators to do filtering. And the notes contain an example of something called a skip iterator, where We're going to take another iterator and a value that we want to skip. And then We can have an iterator that basically is going through the values in an, another iterator, but skipping over some particular value. Uh, and th this would be a, an iterator performing this filtering uh, uh, function. We're not just going through the elements in some sequence, we're actually going through them, that, but providing some extra, or in this case, filtering out ones that we, we don't, want to, don't want to iterate over. All right, questions on generating or filtering? All right, that will do it for this Monday. Uh, turn in lab two, 9 p.m. tonight, or email me uh, to use late days. Uh, I have office hours starting in 10 minutes. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you Wednesday.